We're going to take a first look at hypothesis testing with one sample, specifically testing a single mean. There are a lot of terms and concepts going on. I encourage you to look at the notes and the videos in the notes to get a fuller understanding of this process. Here we're going to just go through things pretty quick and go with the best, um, simplest way to do these five steps. The problem that I have has what we would call a two-tailed test. This is very basic. We don't have any information about the context here, what this is an average that is being measured. Um, right at the top, we do see there's a claim HA. That's what we would call the alternative hypothesis. And in this situation, we basically have two competing hypotheses, an alternative and a null. The null hypothesis comes from the word nil or null from the zero. And then the alternative is a one or an A. If you're thinking in terms of like binary numbers, zero and one are the only two options. I also like using the A because it stands for alternative. The null hypothesis is always going to be an equal sign. Sometimes it might be a greater than equal or less than equal, but it's always going to have that equal sign. That is going to be where we pin down the center of our curve. We're going to assume it's true and draw a normal curve around 66.1. And then we're saying if our sample is too far away, this not equal means we could be way above or way below, then we will reject the null hypothesis. In rejecting the null hypothesis, we will be giving um, evidence towards the claim, which is the alternative. So it's kind of like we assume the null is true. If we see something that's really rare, really far on the edges, then we'll say, eh, that assumption probably wasn't right. Let's go with the only alternative that we've set up here. So these two are complementary situations. It has to be one or the other. To actually answer the problem, we're going through these five steps. We already have step one done. There is a statement that has been made about the nature of the population mean, specifically HA. The statement would be that the population mean is not 66.1. Next, we're going to have our sample data, which has already been collected, then conduct a t-test using staplet.com one quantitative variable single group. I have that over here. If we have a spreadsheet of measurements, we'll go with raw data, something like in the project or in more real life situations. You may have problems in the homework where you need to do that later. But for most problems, we will already have summarized data, meaning someone already found the mean and standard deviation. And for this problem, we'll be looking down below with a mean of 57.4 and a standard deviation of 16.1 with a sample size n of 29. Now you'll see this other piece here. You believe the population is normally distributed. We would need that to be, to be the case because it is a small sample. Once we're under 30, uh, we wanna make sure that it's gonna be predictable by being normally distributed. In Staplet, begin analysis. We only have one option, and that is inference. In that, we could do a T interval. That's like what we did to find a confidence interval. Or we're going to have a T test. We won't use those other options. So for this chapter, we're looking at a T test. The alternative hypothesis is HA. That is a not equal sign. It needs to know whether we're testing it just on the left, just on the right, or both, which kind of doubles our resulting probability. And then the hypothesized mean will come from the null hypothesis, 66.1. So we're essentially drawing a curve around 66.1 and then seeing where our sample lands in that curve. And we got a T score here, tells us that we're about 2.9 standard deviations to the left of the mean. And there's a p-value or probability of 0.007 or 0.7%. So what we're saying is, if the mean is 66.1, our sample is pretty unlikely. That means that the mean probably isn't 66.1, which means at the end of the day, we're going to like HA a whole lot more than we like H0. And we'll see how that pans out in the answer. 
So here, all I need to do is fill in these boxes. The test statistic here is the T-score. That is that measurement of standard deviations. We are 2.910 standard deviations to the left of the mean. That's way over on the left side of the curve. The p-value of 0 0.007. Um, I've got five digits there. I'm having it show a lot of digits. I only need four. Um, and I want to show you a way that we can calculate that p-value um, with maybe a little more precision in some instances. This site has been bugged. I think they fix it. But sometimes this p-value will give you something where it says less than 0 0.001. Um, we can try to come up with that scenario and I'll show you how to handle that. But for now, let me finish this problem. The next thing we will do, and I'm going to go all the way back here. So we got our um, statistics and raw data. Uh, we performed the one sample t-test to get us the t-score or test statistic. Then the p-value is step three. Step four is to make a decision. We're always going to have the same comparison, comparing the p-value to alpha, which is the allowable uh, region of rejection, or you could say up here, it is the probability of a type one error, which is when we reject the null hypothesis when it's true. So it's kind of like um, a if you're in a courtroom and you say, we've got enough evidence to convict here, um, but then actually the person was innocent, um, that would be the situation we're talking about. So sometimes we'll make that probability really small. We'll make sure that there's a lot of evidence needed so that we don't make that um, false, you know, false decision. Sometimes we won't set that quite as high. Um, but there is that comparison. We've got a very, very small p-value, 0 0.007. The alpha would be given in the problem. All the way back up here, 0 0.02 is the allowable we think about that as like the allowable probability. We are smaller than that. When we're smaller, when our p-value is smaller than or equal to alpha, we reject H0. So that'll be the next decision. Uh, less than or equal to, reject the null. Just to let you know, we will never say accept. We're going to reject it or we're going to fail to reject it. One of those two. And lastly, we find the right conclusion. So on mine, my claim was H1 or HA. Remember, those are interchangeable. And then my decision was to reject the null hypothesis. So we're going to line up those and figure out which statement is best. This one we're saying the sample provides sufficient evidence. And that is because we were, we were so far over with our T-score and so small with our P-value. The smaller the P-value, the more evidence we have. If we're kind of in the middle of the distribution, like a T of 0 or 1, we're going to have a big p-value and it's saying, you know, the chances are pretty high that this could happen. But small chances is actually a lot of evidence for us. And then the other thing is, um, this last part we're going to have to figure out if we use the word support or reject the claim. Here we're going to support the claim. We're far away from H0, which looks really good for H1. That was our claim we're going to support it. So we would say the sample provides sufficient evidence at the alpha equals 0.02 level of significance to support the claim that, and the claim was that the uh, mean is not 66.1. So we just go back to the original claim of HA. So I want sufficient to support the claim, sufficient evidence to support the claim. And that's what I've got here. They don't use the word su sufficient, but that is the one we want right there. And there are all of those answers to summarize. So now let's just look at this a little bit further. Let's say that my sample was even more to the left and I had a very, very small p-value. For example, let's try it with a 50 for our mean. We're gonna begin analysis with that. One sample t-tests not equal, 66.1. This is the situation that I was talking about. You may have that very, very small p-value. Um, and what you would need to do is go to staplet.com and actually look at a t-distribution. This is also a great way to visualize what we're seeing here. 
we would need the df degrees of freedom, which is actually just n minus 1 for a 1 uh, quantitative variable. 29 minus 1 is 28. So I put in my 28 degrees of freedom. And then I want to find the area. And I have to decide, is it between left, right, or outside? Well, it turns out, all the way back in the problem, we would need to note HA. And we would want to find something that sort of reflects that statement. So a not equal sign is going to be anywhere too far to the left or anywhere too far to the right. That would be outside of a region. If it's a less than, we just go left. If it's a greater than, we just go right. If it's a not equal, we go outside. And then we'll go to this T. And this T is a negative 5.385, very, very far to the left. That will be on the left side. And then I reflect that to the right side as well. So I use a negative version of the T. I use a positive version of the T. I calculate the area outside. And this is actually rounding to zero. Um, I can go in here and put six digits of precision and see if I get a little more accurate. But I won't. So uh, that gives me... Um, a better answer for rounding out to four decimal places, instead of just saying it's smaller than one thousandth, we could say, well, it actually rounds to zero when we've got these uh, six digits of precision here. And there it is as a decimal or a percent. Just to try a couple other examples, if I got a value of five, that would also be zero. Value of four is going to be where we start to calculate some measurable amount there. Um, so watch out for a T value that gets beyond that third standard deviation. Um, it seems to be somehow bugged in this problem. Here's a variation of the same kind of problem where instead now we have a left tail test. The last one was a not equal sign, which we'd call a two tail test. This one we're saying the claim HA is that the mean is less than 50.6. So when I go to Stapler, I'll start by entering the sample data the same way, begin analysis, and then select a one sample T test. Then putting in the alternative hypothesis as a less than 50.6, I can run the inference and get my test statistic T and my P value. 1.691 negative 1.691 for the test statistic and a p-value of 0 0.0525. Before I showed you how to calculate a precise p-value when it's not being reported with full precision, if you were to get a very very small p-value where it says less than 0 0.001 on this problem, you would want to again go to staplet.com T distributions, enter the degrees of freedom, 22, for a sample size of 23. And then now, because it is a left tail test, we've got a left arrow, we don't need to do the outside a region, we just go to the left and put in our test statistic as a negative, which is what we got. And now we should be shading a region to the left of that, and we'll get that same area. So I didn't have to do that step, but anytime you get a very, very small p-value, that will allow you to get your four digits of precision. Now here's the part that will be different from the previous example. Now I actually have a p-value greater than alpha. Alpha is 0.05. This is slightly larger than that, 0.0525. When the p-value is greater than alpha, now we will fail to reject the null hypothesis. We would say we're kind of within a margin of error that could just be sampling error. And now this will also change the final conclusion. The claim is still HA or H1, but now the decision was failure to reject, so we do not have enough evidence to support that claim. Here is that final answer there is not sufficient evidence to support the claim. So you're looking for two pieces, whether there is or isn't sufficient evidence. You see is versus is not. And then support, or sometimes we'll say rejection, 
which uh, we would only say rejection if the claim was the H0. 